the talks this morning, and now you're going to have to listen to talk about air leaks. Uh, let's see. Disclosures. Uh, I'm not paid by Sealance, uh, Medela, Heimlux, Valve. I get bupkis. Uh, so why are we talking about air leaks this morning? I wanted to first give some background on why it matters and then look at intraoperative and postoperative uh, ways to address the air leaks. This is a paper from uh, 2005 looking at a national um, database looking at uh, prolonged air leaks. Their definition for prolonged air leaks was that it lasted more than five days. 27,000 patients in the database. Um, and when you look at the risk of complications, it correlates um, with the, the uh, presence of a prolonged air leak. So on the left there, you see if patients had no air leaks, then the, the risk, of, total risk of any kind of complication at all was only 8.8%, and that's pretty good. But if once the patients had an air leak, the risk of complications increased almost threefold. Um, I think the definition of, of air leaks uh, as five days or seven days makes some difference in when we should intervene for the air leak, so that's why I put this data in there. So patients that had shorter air leaks defined as between five, three, five and seven days uh, led to a uh, length of stay of 7.8 days. And if the air leak was longer so that it was more than seven days, that increased the length of stay by one day. One day doesn't sound like too much, but it had a significant p-value. When you look, however, at uh, no air leaks or uh, just an air leak for a couple days compared to the longer air leaks lasting more than seven days, that doubled the length of stay. So that's significant, and it shows that um, the five to seven doesn't matter so much. Uh, maybe we should use uh, greater than seven days because of the other data that I'm going to show here. And I think it impacts when you should intervene for air leaks post-op. Um, so here are the patients that had no air leaks versus the patients that had, um, by any either definition, um, prolonged air leaks. So uh, the risk of empyema for the patients that had no air leaks was zero. The risk of empyema was 8% for patients that had prolonged air leaks that lasted more than five days. Uh, so that when patients have an air leak greater than seven days, that doubles the length of stay, it triples the risk of any sort of complication post-op, and, uh, and overall there was about a 10% risk of an empyema. So those are significant uh, outcomes. And I think what that means is uh, because it makes such a big difference when the air leak is seven days or more, that maybe that means we should be aggressively going after addressing prolonged air leaks post-op. So we're going to go into all those different options, and I think that we probably should be more aggressive and earlier in our attempts to fix the air leaks post-op. So what's the economic impact of these uh, prolonged air leaks? I don't need to convince anybody in this room that, uh, that a minimally invasive approach is better than an open case. This was um, six institutions where we looked at a uh, database, 10,000 lobectomies, 2,100 segmentectomies, and the patients that had open operations had a 40% higher um, chance of getting a prolonged air leak post-op. Made a difference in the length of stay. Again, just one day, although the p-value is significant, one day doesn't excite me too much. If it cut it in half or we could do outpatient lobectomies, that would be great. We looked at the hospital costs if patients had prolonged air leaks or if they didn't have prolonged air leaks. And as you can see, the economic impact is substantial. The cost of the care for someone with a prolonged air leak was $15,000 more when patients had prolonged air leaks. So we need to do something about that. What can we do? First off is the surgical technique that was used to do the operation. Um, we all think that um, when patients have a very incomplete fissure, that the risk of an air leak is higher. And then the traditional approach for thoracotomy in the past was to go in the fissure to dissect down to the pulmonary artery. So that was, that's the definition for the traditional approach in this study by Gomez-Carl. 
and then the Fisherless approach, um, which really began a great uh, with great interest with the introduction of that surgery. But when you go from anteriorly to posteriorly and just staple the fissure, then that seemed to uh, reduce the risk of a prolonged air leak. And here's data from the study that does, in fact, confirm that. Traditional approach in this study, seven patients had um, prolonged air leaks versus only one in the fissureless. Uh, and also the probability um, or the, the rapidity with which the air leak stops is much better when it's a fissureless approach. And that had a p-value of uh, 001. Length of stay was um, shorter with a fissureless approach. And, uh, and the uh, cost was greater when the uh, procedure was done traditionally going into, to, into the fissure to find the artery. Um, this is a paper from Italy looking at a different comparison for the way to complete the uh, fissure. Uh, this is a randomized prospective study. 20 patients are randomized to have the fissure completed with the staples. 20 patients are randomized to electric cautery and the use of a sealant, which in this case was uh, Tacoseal. And when you look at that, um, the incidence of air leaks with the staples uh, was a lot higher. The duration of the air leak was a lot shorter for the uh, patients who were randomized to completing the fissure with electric cautery and the tacoseal. And it was more expensive to use, it, uh, use the staples for the operation. What about the, the use of sealants? That paper raises the question of sealants. Should you use them? Um, so Mark Allen and uh, people from six different institutions uh, did this randomized study um, using a 3M product. 161 patients were randomized in the study. And this was interesting because it showed uh, when the air leaks occurred. So in the operating room, when we tested for the air leaks, the control group 77% of the time had uh, an air leak versus only 16% of the time if the sealant was used. But the patients go to the recovery room, they cough once, and that dramatically increases the incidence of air leaks that are found in those patients. So in the recovery room, it was 86% uh, in the control group versus now 65% with a sealant. Again, the, the median length of stay um, was one day. One day still seems like a pretty small number. Doesn't, that, doesn't seem that exciting to me. Uh, Cochrane Database Analysis Review of 17 randomized prospective studies. Three, st three trials showed a reduction in the length of stay when a sealant was used. 13 trials showed no reduction in the length of stay when the sealant was used. And one study showed that the length of stay was even longer if you used a sealant. So the conclusion from that analysis was that sealants are routinely not recommended Again, I wish that they were fantastic and we could have no pain post-op and no air leak and get the chest tube out in the recovery room and, and discharge the patients right away and not have to make rounds on the weekend. But uh, sealants so far not the answer for that are not working that well. And the other thing that they noted was that there was a slight tendency to increase the risk of infections when a sealant was used. Plural tense gained a lot of interest back in the day of lung volume reduction surgery when Joel Cooper was doing a lot of pleural tents to reduce the incidence of air leaks. What about the use of uh, pleural tents for patients that are having lobectomies? This was a prospective randomized trial for patients that had upper lobectomies. 48 patients were randomized, 23 had a pleural tent, 25 had no pleural tent. And this shows the uh, comparison of those two. The top line, as you can see, shows uh, the, uh, for the, the air leak, how long the air leak lasted. If there was a tent, it was just under three days. And if there was no tent, it was 4.68 days. Um, the amount of drainage from the chest tube was a little bit higher when you did the dissection to mobilize the pleura to make the tent. But uh, the next two lines are most important. The, the days that the patients had the chest tubes post-op was not significantly different between using the pleural tent and not using the pleural tent. Same was true for the length of stay. Length of stay was the same in the two groups. So that doesn't seem to be the answer. Heimlich valves. We use a lot of Heimlich valves. Um, 
This, uh, back in the day of lung volume reduction surgery, um, as we showed in the net, 90% of patients post-op have um, air leaks. And the patient that set the record um, was a guy who was in the hospital for 66 days because of his prolonged air leak. I liked him, but I got tired of seeing him every day. So we started using Heimlich valves for patients that had air leaks and kept shortening the number of days uh, before we switched to the Heimlich valve. So we wanted to see what the impact of those Heimlich valves was. Um, we would um, cut the tubing off, put a Heimlich valve on, teach the patient how to check for air leaks at home, and we wanted them to do that every day. When they had two consecutive days with no air leaks, then the patients would come back to the clinic and we would take the tube out. Um, the patients needed to have a visiting nurse every day. There's a paper at uh, STS this year that talked about um, Heimlich valves and sending patients home. They reported a really high incidence of empyema. I think they're doing something wrong because we had not a high incidence of air leak. It was important to have a visiting nurse come by every day. It's very important to change those dressings every day. About 15 years ago at Cedars, all of a sudden we were having a lot of patients with post-op empyemas, and it turned out the nurses were not changing the dressing daily. And then when we took the dressings off a couple times, it smelled like a sewer. So it's really important that you change the dressings and minimize the risk of empyema post-op by doing that. So to analyze our results with the Heimlich valve, we had 107 consecutive patients that had LVRS. 25 of them had prolonged air leaks with a definition of seven days of air leaks uh, after the operation. So the mean number of days in the hospital for LVS with these patients that had prolonged day, uh, air leaks was 9.1 days. And then um, patients had their chest tubes in place for 7.7 .7 days after discharge. So when we look at that, the number of hospital days we saved by discharging the patients, we reduced uh, the hospital stay by 46%. So that seemed like a pretty good number and like it was making a significant difference. So I think that's important. And by the way, 64% uh, of patients had apical air spaces. I know we're all taught that pleural apposition helps the air leak to disappear, that you absolutely have to have pleural apposition, and maybe you put the patients on suction to try to eliminate that. But of these patients that went home with a Heimlich valve, 64% had apical air spaces that varied from one to seven centimeters between the cupula and the top of the lung. Um, in all cases, the apical airspace uh, resolved, the air leak stopped, and follow-up x-rays showed that there was no longer space at the apex. And that apical airspace was not associated with deaths or pneumonia or empyema. Uh, this was uh, the use of the Heimlich valve or, or discharge um, um, drainage system uh, was confirmed uh, in England, as you can see. They saved 772 hospital bed days and they saved 270,000 pounds by discharging patients that way. I think the discharge, system, the discharge drainage system that you use is important. We started using the digital drainage system. I really like it. It's nice. It gives you a digital readout on the amount of drainage that you get from your chest tube. And also, it measures the air leak. Uh, it, uh, it almost makes taking care of patients intern proof. We had a CT resident a few years ago who was wrong 100% of the time. He would tell me there's an air leak and there wasn't, or he would tell me there's no air leak and there is. And there is a difference from minute to minute in, if patients do have air leaks. You may go by right now and see no air leak and somebody comes by um, you know, an hour later and there is an air leak. So it does vary. But to have that digital readout is very nice and you can really see you know, over the course of whatever time period you're looking at if there truly is an air leak or is not. Um, the drainage system has been reported by these four different authors. Um, it did result in a shorter uh, number of days that the patients had chest tubes. It's really nice to see that because, as I said, sometimes um, you'll get an air leak right now and then not after a short uh, time interval. So it shows you what's truly going on over a period of time. And it did uh, reduce the length of stay. Um, blood patches. That was in the title that Mark gave me. 
Um, I think blood patches are important. Out of curiosity, how many people in the audience use blood patches? Hmm, some. Okay, well, blood patches were first described by Robinson back in 1987. Uh, he had success in 25 patients using one, two, or three uh, installations of blood. Uh, so that's an 85% success rate that he had. Uh, he also did a study looking at uh, the amount of blood that you should use. So in these three groups, group C uh, did not have a blood patch and that they were compared with patients in group A that where 50 cc's of blood was used or B where 100 ml of blood was used. And this, the p-values you see there is very significant. Without a blood patch, uh, the average uh, duration of the leak was 6.3 days. If you use 50 ml of blood, it dropped down to 2.3, and if you use 100 ml, it dropped to 1.5. So we typically use a 100 ml of blood. Uh, this was a paper in 2010 looking at the literature, what was published at that point about the use of blood patches. There were 10 studies uh, that involved 109 patients, 91.7% uh, successful or success with the use of the blood patches. This is a paper uh, that compared one institution's experience with different methods of dealing with prolonged air leaks. At the top, you see 20 patients uh, had a blood patch with a 75% success rate. These patients were not randomized between these three different methods. This is just their experience over a period of time. Uh, talc was used in 19 patients, and that was successful 84% of the time. But these days, talc is a bad word and associated with cancer. So we use that really just in patients with a short life expectancy and usually malignant effusions. Tetracycline you can't get. Uh, doxycycline hurts a lot. How quickly does it work? This study was interesting um, to see that. The patients that had the blood patch uh, averaged 27 hours before the air leak sealed. Uh, and in the talc group, it was 54, 51 hours until the air leak sealed and tetracycline took 64 uh, hours. So the blood patch seems to work reasonably quickly. Uh, this is a study looking at uh, 21 patients that had prolonged air leaks. Um, blood was used, uh, the patch was successful with the first uh, application of the blood 81% of the time, and a second um, blood patch was needed in um, 12 patients, 19% of the patients. So again, it works pretty effectively and usually just one application will take care of it. Uh, the technique for doing the blood patch, uh, you draw the blood from the patient. Uh, the, uh, the, the chest tubing is uh, elevated up on, uh, on a chest tube so it's up to the level of the body laying in bed because you don't want all the blood to just come right out immediately after you place it into the patient. Heparin is not recommended to be put into the blood. It is an issue. In some patients, it is hard to uh, get the blood out of a vein. Patients have poor veins. It's great if they happen to have a central line because then it's very quick and easy to draw the blood and put it right into the tubing. Um, generally speaking, most people that use blood patches go second and third post-op day, put the blood in, in two days, if, it, if there's still an air leak, they'll do it again, and you can do as many as three times. If it's not worked by the third application, it's not going to work. Uh, fresh frozen plasma has been reported to be used uh, for the treatment of prolonged air leaks. I've not done this, but this is a, a series of 1,609 patients, 6% of which developed a prolonged air leak post-op. So that's 98 of those patients. And they used one bag, 250 ml of fresh frozen. And of those patients, 92% uh, sealed their air leak within 24 hours. Um, and then um, by two days post-op, 98% had completely sealed their air leaks. Two additional patients, or nine. Yes, two patients at 14 and 19 hours uh, sealed their air leak with that first dose. So sometimes it can happen very quickly and very effectively. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, 
D50, not too many people know about using D50 for pleurodesis, um, but there are a couple of papers about the use of D50. We'll use that uh, in, in certain select patients. It does seem to be effective. This is a study from Japan looking at 46 patients, 35 were post-op, and 11 were spontaneous. Um, they gave 200 ml of D50 and clamped the chest tube if the air leak was not too large. If it was too big, then the patient would get attention, so they didn't do that. But as long as the air leak wasn't too bad, then they would clamp the tube, and it was pretty effective. So what do we do for the, appro with the approach to patients with prolonged air leaks post-op? Uh, we don't use, don't routinely use sealants or uh, pleural tent, and we use no suction on the drainage system uh, post-op for uh, lobes routinely. Um, we, um, if there is an air leak, we'll try to first do all the normal things to do to seal it up, either suture it or staple it. Sometimes patients have centrally located tumors deep in the fissure, the areas that are not amenable to either suturing or stapling, and that's a situation where we would, may use the uh, sealant. Take a pretty aggressive and early approach to this. You saw the impact of prolonged air leaks. If it was between five and seven days, it really hadn't bumped up the risk of complications or empyema significantly. But with the air leaks more than seven days, there was a significant jump up in the risk of empyemas and complications post-op. I think that means that it's good to take an aggressive early approach you want to seal that air leak up quickly before the air leak goes on more than a week and you have a higher risk of empyeme and complications. So second day, third day, when there's not too much drainage and there's still an air leak, we'll do a blood patch. We'll do that every other day, uh, a couple or three times as needed. After um, six days or so, if the patient still has an air leak and we've done the patches, then we'll switch to a Heimlich valve I'll usually keep the patient in the hospital one day after the placement of the Heimlich valve so they get used to the idea of having a tail that they're walking around with. We teach them how to check for the air leak, and I want them to do that every morning. As I mentioned, um, patients pick that up pretty quickly, and it's an easy thing to do, and they're anxious to get rid of that chest tube. So they're checking the um, Heimlich for an air leak each day, two mornings in a row with no bubbles. They come to the office, and we take the tube out. Um, so teaching, teaching them that is important. Daily wound dressing, dressing changes are uh, important. Thank you.